temps de parole. C'est le service vote, c'est ça que je dis, il faut appeler le service vote. Je ne sais pas comment on fonctionne, sinon c'est trop tard. Non, ils sont là, ils sont toujours là au début. Il y en a un, mais je ne sais pas où il est. Ils sont toujours là. Non, 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 c'est que c'est que ça, non, qui est il n'y a pas de comme nous autres. On dit que ça va aussi. Demande à nous, tu vois, Pascal, demande à tout le monde. Il y a Pascal qui est bien. En principe, en principe. Donc si je veux, en minute, quelqu'un sait quoi. Mais c'est ça que je ne sais pas. Je sais comment le démarrer, c'est ici. Oui, mais c'est ça. En fait, vous appuyez ici et c'est le temps qui commence. Non, c'est pour ça qu'il faut appeler les services d'autres.
Are they wishing you good luck? Yeah. It's my first hearing. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Dear colleagues, and back to your seats. I'm going to chair in French, so if you have to put your earphones on, it's the right time. <laughs> I'd like to start by welcoming Madame Commissioner Designate. Welcome to this hearing. This is the first hearing for the NV Committee. We will be uh, meeting uh, two commissioners and one executive vice president. The Envy Committee is the largest committee in the European Parliament uh, within this legislature. Uh, Madame Commissioner designated it's a clear signal of the importance we, the European Parliament, uh, attach uh, to this uh, um, topic and this area. Um, in the mission letter sent to you by President-elect Ms. van der Leyen. There are health issues uh, mentioned in there, the fight against uh, cancer, also issues around uh, food safety, the fight against pollution as well, and the farm-to-fork strategy as well. So uh, a lot uh, of topics there to uh, keep us busy today. Madam Commissioner Designate, uh, if you'll allow me uh, one remark before giving you the floor and, and before I explain the procedure for this hearing as well. Take the majority of the uh, members of the Envy Committee who I've been able to speak to over the past few days and, and since we received your um, written answers, well, we have um, a shared uh, feeling In relation to health, in your written answers, there are some very specific answers, some very specific commitments, and uh, something that really um, uh, picks up on, on your uh, professional uh, uh, life. However, there are still some questions uh, on the responses around uh, food safety. Uh, we'll come back to these uh, throughout uh, the hearing, but we felt some of the, the answers were vaguer. So we have just been in uh, a hearing with the uh, Commissioner for Agriculture, and we, again, thought there were some very vague answers there. So we will be hoping from you some very specific answers to some specific questions which will be put to you by the members of this committee. Now, how will the debate be organised? The coordinators have, have slightly adjusted uh, um, how things will run. So the organisers will have one minute, 15 seconds to ask your questions. And then the commissioner-designate will have two minutes to reply. Then there will be an additional 45 seconds for a follow-up question from coordinators. We have been asked uh, to ensure that the follow-up questions really are follow-up questions. That the, the second follow-up question um, is a chance to follow up on the first question, but not the opportunity to uh, open up a, a new topic because the Commission doesn't think we only have one minute to reply to that and you and coordinators will only have 45 seconds to ask the question. So it's difficult to... Uh, address a whole new topic in uh, that time. So I could I ask you to keep to that, please? I'd now like to give the floor to the Commissioner-designate for 15 minutes, please, Madam, you have the floor. Thank you. Dear Chair, Honourable Members of the Envy and Agri Committees, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is indeed a great honor for me to be here today before the democratically elected representatives of the people of Europe to seek your approval 
as Commissioner for Health. But allow me please to start with a few words in my own language, Greek. It is a great honor for me to be here today as Commissioner-designate. We all know that health issues are of the utmost importance for everyday citizens, for European citizens and their daily life. This is going to be my compass during my term as Commissioner, if approved by the European Parliament. Dear friends and colleagues, European citizens expect the peace of mind that comes with access to health care, safe food to eat, and protection against epidemics and diseases. They deserve this. We have some of the world's highest standards on animal and plant health, and the most affordable, accessible, and high-quality health systems to deliver on these expectations, to do away with inequalities. The von der Leyen Commission wants to lead a European Union that does strive for more. For our generation, Europe was a project built to bring peace, unity, and prosperity. For our children, Europe needs to be much more. They tell us loud and clear about their strong desire to live a natural and healthy environment on a green and sustainable planet. I have spent my life serving public causes. I have been elected three times to my national parliament and I, was, I had the honour of being elected to be president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. 27 years working with children and adolescents as a clinical psychologist in public hospitals on mental health for those among us who are frequently forgotten. I know firsthand the importance of well-functioning health systems and that the collective health of our societies depends on the individual health of every single citizen. But that alone is not enough. It depends also on the general health of our planet. I am here before you today ready to commit all my energy, all my knowledge, and all my skills to serving these European causes as Commissioner for Health for the next five years. Dear friends, health is an area where the European Union should strive for more. We cannot be complacent by what we have achieved. We see transformations in climate, in technology, and in demography, which change our societies and our ways of life. Europe must lead the transition to a healthy planet and the new digital world. These are challenges that all impact our quality of life. They impact social cohesion, competitiveness, and economic growth. We can only deal with them successfully with a One Health, Health in All Policies approach. The Green Deal is an opportunity to address these challenges holistically. It places good health and sustainable, nutritious, affordable food under a single policy umbrella, also climate neutrality and zero pollution. I am delighted that my work on food safety, animal welfare and plant health will be a significant part of this agenda, and I am thrilled to lead our work on a new farm-to-fork strategy on sustainable food. It will address every single step of the food chain and reach every actor within it, putting social inclusion at its core. These are challenges I recognize, but I'm not afraid taking them on, knowing that you will be a key partner in this process. As a parliamentarian myself, I recognize the crucial role played by these committees and I look forward to working closely with you in the coming years.
I have met many of you in the last few weeks, and it is clear to me that we share common ground on many issues. Protecting citizens from risks like endocrine disruptors, reducing our dependency on pesticides, promoting animal health and animal welfare are issues in which I want to join forces with you. At the same time, I will work closely with national governments, knowing very well that implementing and enforcing EU rules in this area is something we can certainly improve on. It is vitally important we avoid the damage that is done to consumer confidence and public health when rules aren't followed. Building trust is imperative if we are to succeed. Transparency and honesty need to be our beacons. We need to clamp down on issues such as food fraud that undermine the single market and the trust of our citizens. I want to ensure that we have the right means to keep our citizens healthy and for this, a steady stream of affordable medicines is vital. The EU pharmaceutical system has given citizens access to high quality and affordable medicines for decades. I will focus on implementing a modernized and more robust legislative framework for medical devices. This needs to be done in order to improve patient safety and consolidate the EU's role as a global leader in this field. Digital technologies, artificial intelligence need to be leveraged in this effort as they can bring concrete benefits to patients and to healthcare professionals. I want to maximize this potential and I see the creation of a European health data space as an important step in the right direction. On all these issues, Europe has a special place to play on the world stage. A European Union that strives for more simply cannot afford to look inwards. The scope of our action should be global and multilateral, reaching far beyond our borders. Antimicrobial resistance is a danger happening both in Europe and in the world. The clock is ticking. We need to act now. Europe should lead this global effort, and I will advocate for an international agreement on the use and access of, to antimicrobials. For that main reason, I will also prioritize the implementation of the European One Health Action Plan against antimicrobial resistance. Ladies and gentlemen, I will close with cancer, a flagship priority for the next Commission and very close to my heart. Europe's beating cancer plan. 40% of us will face cancer in our lives. There are not many families who have not been in some way touched by this disease. This in itself is reason enough for cancer to be one of the top priorities in the area of health. Beating cancer will require all hands on deck and a truly horizontal health in all policies approach. Everything from the food we eat the lifestyles we lead, the medicines, the care, the technology we have access to are highly relevant to beating cancer. Each is a link in a chain that has one aim only, to reduce the impact of cancer in Europe. I see our beating cancer plan touching upon all the actions in my mission letter. Farm to fork, the Green Deal, antimicrobial resistance, innovation, affordability of medicines. It needs to address prevention, diagnosis, treatment, research, survivorship, and palliative care. It needs to involve sectors and industries beyond the health sector, including education and environment. I have worked with the European Parliament on cancer in the past, 
in my capacity as President of Europa Donna, the European Breast Cancer Coalition, as a patient advocate, always working in partnership with the medical community, industry, government, and parliaments. I was, in fact, one of those involved in the passing of the first resolution of breast cancer in this parliament in 2003. Making a difference in the life of cancer patients has always been my guiding principle. And speaking from personal experiences, I can assure you that it will continue to be my guiding principle in my current mission if I am confirmed as a commissioner. Ladies and gentlemen, being commissioner will empower me with the opportunity to uphold principles I've believed in and worked passionately for all my life. I will work with the European Parliament, with member states, stakeholders, my fellow commissioners, to improve public health and secure a sustainable future for Europe. Where we diagnose weaknesses in our systems, we must come together to deliver a cure, working with energy, ambition, and commitment. Building partnerships based on trust, honesty, transparency, and accountability. Many of you asked me in Strasbourg what I hope to achieve in the next Commission's mandate. And this has been in my thoughts from day one of this journey. In five years' time, I want us to look back and say, we delivered an ambitious cancer plan and reduced the suffering caused by cancer. We provided healthier and greener food for our citizens. We improved public health and patients' access to health care. We reached out to European citizens' everyday lives. We made sure Europe works for all its citizens in the area of health. We took up the challenges and we delivered. And this is why I am here before you today to ask for your support in reaching these goals together. Let us join forces to inspire, to fulfill our promises to future generations. L'Union fait la force. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. So, uh, organizational point. We will begin with seven questions one each from the seven uh, political groups uh, in this House. The question will be asked why by the um, coordinator or the uh, representative, and then we'll follow that with 18 questions uh, in accordance with the De Hunt uh, methodology. I'd like to highlight uh, the point uh, that probably... Some questions from members of the Agriculture Committee who are associated to this hearing. So we will begin with the first of the seven questions from the political groups with EPP, Delos Montserrat. One minute, 15, please. Gracias, Presidente. Thank you, Chairman. Commissioner Designate, I could really identify with what you said on the fight against cancer. Many of us here have lived through cancer or have known people who have been affected by it. It is an implacable disease and it's moving towards being the number one cause of death in Europe. You said it. Over 40% of us Europeans will suffer from cancer at some point in our lives. 1.4 million Euro uh, Europeans will lose their lives this year as a result of cancer. Patients with cancer in Central and Eastern Europe are 30% less likely to be cured than those in Western Europe, and that situation is unacceptable. But in spite of that tough reality, there are reasons for hope. We have excellent researchers and professionals. Mortality has decreased by 10% and between 30 and 50 percent of cancers are avoidable. If we promote healthy habits, if we invest more in prevention, and if we improve early 
detection, we could double survival rates by doing those things. So, Mum, the EPP is leading the European struggle against cancer, and my question is, will this plan include measures to include fairness when it comes to access to treatments? Thank you. Thank you very much, Madame Montserrat, for that question. And it really, um, as I had said, it's a topic very close to, to my heart personally. The European Beating Cancer Plan needs to cover all what you have mentioned. And this plan, if it is effective, can leave no one behind. We cannot speak about inequalities when we're talking about cancer care. We need to focus on all the aspects, from prevention to palliative care, because it is really unacceptable that when we know today that we can prevent almost 30% of all cancers, that we are not investing enough in changing lifestyles which we know will lead to less suffering. I want to touch on something you also mentioned about diagnosis. And many countries have set up screening programs. But these screening programs, to be effective, need to be accredited and they need to be following European guidelines. And I know that the European Parliament, and I want to thank you for it, in 2019 had a resolution on women's cancers and on HPV. Access to medicines, affordability of medicines, is a crucial part of the European Beating Cancer Plan. And this will override together with other aspects that we need to look at. And I mentioned, I mentioned earlier in my opening the antimicrobial risk. A number of cancer patients lose their lives because of the antimicrobial problem. So we really need to look at it horizontally and see how we're going to deal with this across all policies of health and not in an isolation. This is something that I intend to dedicate a great deal of efforts to. Thank you. Thank you. Follow-up question? Yes, thank you, Commissioner-designate. Well, as you have so correctly said, we need to have the same opportunities for all European patients. No one should be left behind in the fight against cancer. We can't have first and second class patients in Europe. During recent years, there have been many initiatives that emerged from member states to deal with inequality when it comes to accessing treatments, uh, the Valletta Agreement and others, and that's all positive, but we need to go further. So I suggest that uh, together we promote a European level initiative to ensure fair access to treatments and to share best practice so we can be more effective in the fight against cancer and all other diseases. There are many different faces of cancer and we need to deal with all of them. We also need to ensure that patients are treated in a holistic manner, as you so well said, and that includes not only the medical side of things, but social assistance to patients and their families. And we also need to look at mental health for our society, anxiety, depression, stress, etc. We need to invent, invest more in prevention uh, to create a more healthy Europe. Investing more will help us to understand more about cancer. So which measures are you going to push to improve investment in cancer. For your answer, please stick to the concept of a follow-up question in 45 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the European Beating Cancer Plan needs to include everything. You spoke about the inequality of treatments. I want to touch on something positive that has come out of this Parliament, and that is the cross-border health directive, because that had showed when we're cooperating how we can change patients' lives. I want to touch on the European reference networks, which has given access to rare diseases, pediatrics, and adults with rare cancers to exchange knowledge without the patient moving. So I believe in collaboration, and I believe that there is a lot to, we can do. I do not have a quick fix answer for the shortage of medicines. 
I have proposals that I would like to take up if I get through this hearing successfully, but I will commit to the European Beating Cancer Plan. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Now for the Socialist and Democrat group, you to go to land, please. Uh, Commissioner Designate Kyriakides, exposure to even low doses of endocrine disruptors actually are linked to a series of very serious illnesses like cancer, diabetes, infertility, um, and other deformities. And small children are particularly sensitive here. So apart from the human suffering, these uh, things actually cost a lot. More than 160 billion euros annually is the cost of these problems. So it's not possible for human beings to avoid these substances in their daily lives. They're everywhere. They're in toys, they're in our water, they're in cosmetics, they're in food packaging. So everybody has the right to a life without this exposure. So I'd like to know if you are going to propose, without any further delays, horizontal criteria to identify these uh, disruptors in all sectors. Can you promise here today that you are going to actually react in a concrete way to deal with this serious problem instead of hiding behind the Commission's very weak strategy, which dates back to 2018, or... uh, further uh, promises about vague fitness checks. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm a person that looks forward, so I will comment on what I would like to be doing now, from now on, uh, Madame Goodland, and I will, um, I will say, and I want to thank you for this question, because endocrine, endocrine res- disruptors are in fact in my mission letter which in itself shows that it is going to be a priority. And you're absolutely right that we need to do more because it does, they do impact on human health. We don't have any doubt about that now. Um, the, I'm aware of the European Parliament Resolution of 2019 and I'm also aware that the European Parliament wants to see legislation before 2020. The, we need to step up to define horizontal criteria and I think this needs to be a priority. We have made progress in the last 20 years. I don't want to to say that no progress has has been made, but we need to do a lot more because we know that we are here for one reason alone, at least as a designate commissioner for health, I'm here for one reason alone, and that is a commitment to protect citizens and the environment. There was something that I would want to add, if I may, to your question, is that we need more science to see the cocktail effects as well, which we are not aware of at the moment. So, yes, I would look at um, waiting for the results of the fitness check to see how we can move forward. Already some member states are taking action plans on this. We need to support them. And I believe that we are all aware that endocrine disruptors are going to be a very important part of the agenda of the next commission. Thank you very much for that answer. I'm not going to have an argument with you about this today, but I would like to have a further clarification. Do you agree that endocrine disruptors are actually just as dangerous as cancer and other um, toxic substances. And if you're going to take a cross-sectoral approach to this, um, then we need to have a distinction between what are suspected as endocrine disruptors and already um, covered by European legislation and then other uh, toxic substances. Thank you. I definitely wouldn't want to have an argument with you about anything. What I would like to have is a chance to have the opportunity to discuss with you and hear from you to take in all these concerns. And that is why I said I would be available. I wouldn't, um, uh, I wouldn't compare whether endocrine disruptors are as dangerous as cancer. I know that they impact on human health. And I know that we need to do something about it. And this is going to be my commitment to taking this up. We're waiting for the uh, fitness check. I would look forward to working with you, to seeing what we need to do to move forward, because it is definitely not an area that we can afford 
to leave behind. And I'm clear on that. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to give the floor to myself, which is always the proper rule. <laughs> so, Bas, as a first vice chair, will chair for the minute and uh, 15 seconds. Madame la, la commissaire. Commissioner designate, I'd like to ask a question on pesticides. In your written responses to our questions, you said we should collectively think about the possibility of implementing uh, a compulsory um, reduction target for the risk of pesticides or risks linked to pesticides. I think we should collectively think about the possibility of that's, that's not really acting. My question is therefore quite simple. As part of the farm to fork strategy, will you support a targeted aim for pesticide reduction and for associated risks, risks of pesticides or not? Thank you very much. We are all aware that um, there is a, a strong legislation in place concerning pesticides. But we are also aware, and we need to recognize this, that it is not properly implemented. I want to thank the European Parliament for forming the Pest Committee, which has delivered significant results and I know has been very critical on member states. The report of that committee demands transparency, but it also demands accountability. And for me, that is a very important word. There is an ongoing evaluation through REFIT, which we need to look at. I'm hopeful and optimistic that changes in the general food law, which will increase transparency, will be positive in this direction. What I can uh, say, Monsieur Canfin, to your answer, I can say this, at least for myself, is that um, I can commit to decreasing the dependence that we have on pesticides and to trying to invest and encourage to find low-risk alternatives. I think this is our responsibility. This is part of what is in the President-elect's mission letter, both for Green Deal and Farm to Fork. And I intend to follow this very closely so as to be able to deliver. Citizens are very concerned. We need to respect them, and we need to move forward as effectively as possible. Les, les pesticides. pesticides have uh, impacts on human beings. Uh, uh, that's why we need uh, an aim with uh, targets for reduction. They also have impacts that pesticides do on bees. Uh, here in the European Parliament, we're looking at uh, the possible refusal of the Commission's position on their methodology for uh, impact of pesticides on bees. Uh, if in a few weeks we do not uh, um, endorse the Commission's current pros proposal, um, will you commit to following the EFSA's um, proposal? And then you, along with us, we can work together to um, pressure member states um, and do as F EFSA has asked us for a full impact assessment uh, from EFSA in this area. What I can to commit to, if I am allowed to commit to as a designate commissioner, is that um, there will be no lowering on the bar on the protection of bees and other pollinators. I think we, need to, we have all realized that this is extremely important. Bee protection needs to be a center of our policies, and this is also part of the policies of the Green Deal that is in the mission letter. I am aware that the Commission banned three neonics in uh, 2013, if I'm not mistaken, 
But I'm also aware that there has been considerable difficulty in um, the uh, application of the big guidance document by EFSA. EFSA and member states have now agreed to move forward looking at acute toxicity. They're reviewing the results because we also need to look at chronic toxicity. And we need to find a consensus. For myself, decreasing the, new, the use of neonics and finding alternatives is a primary concern. But I also work through consensus, and I will try working with Parliament, working with my member states, to try, find a way forward so that we do work into the application of the big guidance document so that we actually protect our environment. Sometimes when we're talking about bees and pollinators, and I know that when you see the health portfolio, one thinks it's just public health, but it's not, because health is one health. Health is our planet, health are, are our plants, our animals. It is everything. It's the food we eat. And knowing this, I cannot say that this is less important than other aspects that Madame Montserrat raised before. We're all part of this and living on this planet which we need to protect. And that is my responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. For the Greens, Michel Rivasi. Thank you very much indeed, and a warm welcome to you, to this committee. I'm not particularly satisfied with your answer to Mr. Confan's question, because you said that the new commission is committed to achieving the zero pollution objective, and you know that we've had a lot of uh, arguments with your predecessor in the area of pesticides, particularly when it comes to endocrine uh, disruptors and glyphosate. The European Parliament was so unhappy with the work of the Commission in the area of pesticides that a special committee was indeed created uh, calling for a number of improvements on legisl uh, uh, with legislation on pesticides. But unfortunately, we haven't been heard, and now we have another big bust-up in the pipeline. The European Parliament has asked the European Commission to adopt EFSA orientations and guidelines on bees, so we have full implementation of the legislation. We're talking about the legislation, Commissioner-designate. Pesticides should only be approved if they have no chronic toxic effect, which is unacceptable for bees. And yet... There are a number of member states opposing this, and the Commission has just abstained from its duty, and uh, the MV is now going to uh, adopt an objection in this area. So my question is, if you become Commissioner, are you going to change the Commission's approach on this, and over the next three months, are you going to unveil a legislation which fully applies EFSA guidance on bees when it comes to toxic, chronic toxicity when it comes to domestic bees. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. I could hear. Thank you so much for that question. I could hear your frustration, but I cannot answer for what has happened. What I can commit to is how we see it now, and what is in my mission letter and what was in the president-elect uh, program. And we're talking very specifically now about the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork, and these are priorities. Legislation, I'm a parliamentarian. Legislation is there to be applied, and we, we should all be working towards that. You asked me if I would commit to put forward legislation in three months. You know that we work as a college and a college at decisions, but I can commit to something. I can commit to trying to build a consensus in order to become more effective so we do implement the legislation. And for myself, these are not empty words and these are not slogans. It's on my mandate. Farm to Fork is on my mandate. Being part of the Green Deal, which is under Senior Vice President Timmermans, is, is in our mandate. And I need to work closely with everyone to deliver. So pesticides, um, 
I recognize and I think we all recognize that the legislation has not been properly implemented. The Pest Committee has come out with a report I want to thank you for that was very critical but spoke a lot of truths. And now it's going to be up to the next commission and if I'm health commissioner to deliver on this. That's it. Well, you're not really answering the question, I'm afraid, because the problem is that we have the 2009 legislation, which says that you have to take into account chronic effects, and the Commission and the Member States are not respecting that point. So, again, I'm asking you to propose a bill to the council. We need to have a political push on this, not a technical one. If you make this a political issue and you say that the council with qualified majority can decide on this, then as parliamentarians we can make a difference at the level of the member states. But you're actually not bold enough at the commission to come up with a draft piece of legislation on this for the council. So if you do become commissioner, please Make a sensible proposal so we fully implement the FSERT guidelines on bees. And that should be dealt with then at council level. Make it a political issue, not a technical one. Oh, I agree with you that it's a political issue. It's not a technical one. And that's why I said before that I would like to have the opportunity to work with member states and move forward on this, because you're absolutely right. We cannot just look at acute toxicity. We're waiting now the results to see the chronic toxicity, and I will work based on science. So what I can commit to is that I will be taking this up and putting it forward. For one reason alone, because I believe that it is an extremely important part of protecting our planet, our environment, and our everyday lives within the Green Deal and Farm to Fork. Thank you. Thank you. So we are moving to ID and Sylvia Limer. Well, I have your written answers to our questions. I read them very carefully, and I want to pick up on two issues which are can't simply be explained away by talking about sustainability. Organ donation. Now, in individual member states, there have been different rules on this. In Germany, they're discussing the uh, rule by which you can say no, the opt-out rule. Now, this are you going to stick to the situation pursuant to which we have subsi subsidiarity in the EU, i.e. that member states decide on organ, do organ donation, or do you want to introduce a European system? And if there is going to be a European level rule, what's it going to look like? <coughs> Secondly, you have the problem of increasing antibiotic resistance, but uh, you haven't really come up with any solutions, for, for example, and you haven't gone into the problem of the fact that new substances don't seem to work. I mean, how do you want to deal with those issues, given that uh, there are extremely high costs to having antibiotics left in the cupboard and used as a kind of reserve stock? It makes it uh, developing new pharmaceuticals not worthwhile for the pharmaceutical industry. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to try and answer that in two minutes. Thank you for the both questions. Um, organ donation is a huge, of hugely importance to all member states. It's of hugely importance because we know that uh, so many people's lives depend on it. And what we have to put as a priority is um, the safety and um, uh, work towards and support innovation because we need to move forward with this. I am aware that in uh, some member states there is the opt-out system. Um, this has not worked in all member states. I am also aware that there is an evaluation about to come out from the Commission. I think it's uh, towards the end of 2019. And I would wait to see that before deciding how to proceed. Member states have put action plans in place, but whether we need to have a European 
umbrella strategy or not, I would wait to see the evaluation. I recognize that it is a very, it's a huge um, uh, issue because it does involve so many people and so many people are on the waiting list and there can be nothing worse. For antimicrobial resistance, you're right. I didn't mention what we should be doing. We established that we have a problem. We have 30,000 deaths in the EU every year from antimicrobial resistance. In 2017, the Commission had a second action plan, and if I'm not, I could be mistaken, uh, there were about 70 actions under a One Health Agenda. The One Health Agenda, the whole point of it is to put human, animal, environment under one umbrella. So we need to look at it holistically. We need a global response because it's a global problem. That's why WHO and the G20 have taken it up. And part of this is encouraging industry to come forward through innovation with new um, antibiotics. It's a devastating problem. It doesn't respect borders. So we all need to have a global response. And I would like to see Europe lead in this. Well, you didn't answer any of my questions because I was looking for your personal opinion whether you thought there should be an EU level uh, organ donation uh, regulation. You skillfully wormed your way out of that, I didn't expect anything else. And then when it came to antimicrobial resistance, you didn't say how you wanted to push for developments if you don't want to let reserve uh, antibiotics be used. I suppose that was more of a statement I've just made. Thank you. No, it was a question, but um, I can only give you the answer that is going to be my honest answer. Whether I, we put forward an umbrella strategy for Europe on organ donation, I would like to see the evaluation which is expected at the end of 2019 so as to be able to see where we are and how we move. We need to move with evidence, with science, so we're making the right decisions. So it could have been very easy for me to say now, yes, I will propose that, but I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say something that I wasn't able to substantiate without having all my information. And the Commission evaluation is due out at the end of this year. As for antimicrobial resistance, I think we must lead by example, and we need to help industry through innovation come up with new, new uh, antimicrobials. Thank you. We are moving, sorry, we are moving to ECR with Joanna Komsinska. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, in response to the questions that have been submitted in writing, you declare close cooperation with the entire College of Commissioners and uh, the representatives of other stakeholders and uh, industry in order to meet uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations. You say that we need to mobilize all the accessible instruments in public health, research, science, and uh, medical policy. You also mention certain intentions concerning in integrated mobilization of the agencies that are involved. So do you see any need for a better coordination of activities undertaken by the European Commission, DG Santa DEFCO, and, and the one responsible for research and uh, streamlining of their tasks in the area of uh, health policy so that the actions are indeed comprehensive uh, and uh, in line with the UN agenda, especially objective number three. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much for that question. We can always have better coordination in so much that we do. The um, president-elect has laid out very clearly how we will work together as a college. And many of the areas, especially the area that we're speaking about being health today, goes horizontally. So it's part of 
I dare say, if I am Commissioner of Health, my duty to work closely with all the other commissioners who are part of the Green Deal of Farm to Fork and of Public Health. Commissioner Timmermans, Commissioner Schinas, which is Public Health, and Commissioner Vestager, because we need to put the digital agenda into the health policy. So my intention would be to work closely with all in order to be able to deliver what we have pledged to deliver. In relation to better coordination, I am um, someone that works across um, institutions and organizations. I try to reach consensus and I try to see where things are not streamlined, how we can help streamline them. I intend to uh, use this approach in my mandate, listening carefully to Parliament and to parliamentarians who many times are able to pick up something that we are not able to see. So yes, I do see working together closely with other commissioners as imperative. I do see better coordination necessary in some areas, and both of those are going to be part of my agenda if I'm next health commissioner. Don't you believe that the European Commission, after the reform and after the reshuffling of agendas of the individual DGs, could contribute to the European pharmaceutical industry coming back to Europe, which would ensure greater safety for our continent and at the same time ensure a better access to all the necessary drugs. Thank you. Uh, I am aware that this is a great concern to many and I'm also aware that we have a dependence on uh, pharmaceuticals coming from third countries and we need to be extremely cautious about this in terms of the levels of control we have so that, that, we have, so that they're safe. Yes, I believe that we need to invest and encourage innovation and Europe should be a leader in this in terms of the pharmaceutical industry. It is very important that we do this and the whole pack package that we are discussing here today and we are sharing together uh, involving digitalization in fact is what ensures the need for us to keep up with scientific development. We need to work across all policy areas. I wish, because I'm someone that has um, worked in the health sector, but as a parliamentarian, I'm also in touch with people who need medicines all the time. And I know what it means to have a shortage of medicines, and I know what it means to have a problem with affordability of medicines. And I wish I could sit here today and say I had a quick fix answer, but I don't. What I do know is that we need to look at the whole area. We need to look at pricing and reimbursement. There is a legal obligation by pharmaceutical industry to ensure that patients have access and supply of medicines. We need to work closely and try and have a holistic pharmaceutical strategy so as to be able to deliver what, um, what we need for patients. I, I want to also mention something that hasn't been mentioned. Maybe it'll come up. I haven't got long to say. But the health technology assessment, which is something extremely important, is, I believe, uh, one of the steps forward if, if we're able to follow through on this. So uh, looking at this and looking at possible new business models, we need to keep Europe at the front of this agenda. Thank you. For the GUE, Katerina Konechna. Thank you, Chairman. Dear Madam Commissioner Designate, uh, I would like to uh, draw upon your last sentence, uh, which relates to my question. According to the Eurobarometer, most Europeans wish uh, that the EU uh, tackled health more, and uh, um, many of them even think uh, that measures taken by the EU in health are insufficient. And I'm sure that uh, you and I will agree that not all Europeans have the same right to access to treatment, which is uh, especially true for rare diseases, but not only for them. 
And this is a problem that we deepen by a lack of common European health technology assessment. And you have said that if you succeed, you, you use the word to succeed, but I, I'm asking you, will you continue to support the Commission proposal uh, which was uh, approved by this Parliament in the last legislature? What are you going to do to unblock the situation in Council? Because without a uh, Europe-wide HTA, nothing will change uh, as far as the access of patients to healthcare is concerned. The Commission proposal was in 2018 and there was, I think, a Parliament resolution in 2019. Health technology assessment is central. And it's central because it allows patients to know that what they are having in terms of medicine are safe. It's central because it allows patients to know if they're going to have an, uh, an examination that the machinery that is being used is safe and it's central because it allows innovation. I am extremely aware that there is a reluctance by some member states to move ahead with this. But we also need to understand that no state should be left behind. We need to pool resources, we need to have common standards in order to protect patients. And this I believe is something that uh, I would work really very strongly uh, towards, trying to build a consensus so that finally the Commission proposal of 2018 concerning health, te health technology assessment moves forward because I think it is an imperative part of any health system that we as Europeans want to promote. Well, I would like to tell you that this is not just about safety, but about effectivity and uh, searching for consensus. Well, uh, I wish you good luck in finding consensus with the member states, but uh, it will be very tough. And I think that we should all realize, including our colleagues with the member states, that without this, we can never guarantee the same treatment for all. But in HTA, we have even succeeded in including the patient dimension much more. And I would like to ask you whether you intend to expand the role of patients in all the other legislation. Do you want to get them involved? Are you going to take them seriously and respect them? This is a challenging question and I'll answer it the way that it comes out. Uh, I myself am a patient advocate. I'm a patient advocate because um, it's not something that is... Uh, is not known, I, I have been uh, diagnosed uh, and have gone through cancer. And I've heard, worked all my life very closely with the patient community. And in the country that I know best, uh, we managed to have legislation which allows the patient organizations to have a seat at the table every time a decision is made that concerns them. So yes, I would work very closely with patients but I would also work closely with all other stakeholders in order to try and find a way forward for this consensus for health technology assessment. It's become obvious that the voluntary way is not working. We need the standards and we need to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. So we are moving to the uh, second round of questions uh, beyond the coordinators or their representatives. So we start again with the EPP and Christian Boussoy. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Designate uh, congratulations for the very good presentation. But I would like to refer to an issue that uh, you didn't have the chance to detail in your necessary short introduction, which is one of the biggest challenges that we have uh, in our health system, digitalization. Either that we are referring to the availability of e-prescription, the existence or not of electronic health records of patients, the existence or not of patient registries, mainly for cancer and hepatitis, or interoperability of the different systems and the cross-border exchange of health data, but also on the development 
and use of mobile health, telemedicine, artificial intelligence and robots in health services, there is still much to be done in many member states, but also at EU level. The concept of digital health continues to evolve rapidly, and I would like to reiterate that the evolution in finding cures and treatments, but mainly in better organizing and allocating more efficient the resources in our health systems, in what word the evolution of our health systems cannot be done without innovation and digitalization. My short question is, as future Commissioner for Health, if you'll be supported by the Parliament, what measures do you intend to take to support the digitalization of health sector in the European Union? Thank you very much, Mr. Bussoy. Thank you for that question. As um, you may have seen, the, um, it's in my mission letter, the um, uh, formation of European health data space. Digitalization is a very important part uh, of any health agenda, and it can, um, uh, it's extremely significant for citizens. We have seen the effects of this because progress is being made, and I want to recognize this. For example, in cross-border health, in 2019, we're seeing for the first time e-prescriptions between two member states and these patient summaries. And these in itself are important because it shows that we can have continuity of care across borders, and we need to do this for patients. We are committed to digitalization as a commission. It's something that will promote research and innovation. We already have the European um, re reference networks, and these are allowing people with rare diseases and pediatrics to be able to have this uh, um, access. And I believe that it can radically change patient care and treatment. So, yes, we would be fully committed, but I will add one little angle that we sometimes don't mention. We need to be careful as well with data protection for patients. So this is something that we should always have in mind when we're talking about e-health. Data protection has to be equally important and protecting data. Um, the European health data space is what will pull in together all the data, and this is uh, part of the, my mission letter, and I look forward to working with Commissioner Vestager in order to move this forward as soon as possible. Thank you very much. I totally agree with data protection, and also when you talk about robots or uh, artificial intelligence, many ethical issues are there to be solved. But in order to realize this interoperability, to have, let's say, a European format for uh, uh, health records that one citizen could have his health record useful in other member states that his own, you will need support from the member states and you will need support of citizens. Do you plan to increase the information to patients on e-health issues and also do you uh, intend to promote a more efficient exchange of information between member states? One problem that I see is that not all member states are at the same level. And this is a problem because we need everyone to move forward together. And with digitalization, not everyone is at the same place. So we need to encourage member states and help those that are not so advanced to be able to move forward. This is very important because if we're going to use the, the cross-border directive, which has changed the lives of so many patients, and let's see also the positive that has come out in the last few years, we need to encourage member states to move forward with e-health. I'm aware of the problems. I'm also aware of something that you picked up, which uh, unfortunately is often um, not mentioned. I'm very glad you mentioned it. We need to increase the information available to patients because patients are not aware sometimes of what is out there and what they can use. So it is, a me it is the obligation of member states to keep patients informed. Thank you. For SND, Rory Palmer. 
Thank you. If you uh, bring forward an ambitious cancer plan for Europe, I'm sure you will find a parliament that is united and determined uh, in matching that ambition and working collaboratively to build that plan. And I'm pleased that you have mentioned frequently this evening the importance of prevention. That is fundamental to the cancer plan. It is also fundamental to tackling health inequalities. Now, any meaningful attempt to build a cancer plan with prevention at its heart will mean standing up to some very powerful interests, the tobacco industry, the alcohol industry, chemical producers, food manufacturers. So I'd like to know what your approach would be to some of the very difficult conversations which will be integral to that agenda. And specifically, what measures will you bring forward to reduce the use of tobacco and ensure more responsible levels of alcohol consumption amongst our population? Would I be willing to have that conversation? Yes. Would I be willing to lower the bar? No. We cannot lower the bar when we're talking about prevention in terms of cancer. And we know that we can prevent many of the cancers that take people's lives today. We need to look at tobacco. There is a tobacco regulation, but we need to work very, very intensively, the tobacco directive, I'm sorry, in order to ensure that we are reaching the young people who unfortunately now are uh, using more and more tobacco, and this is putting the, their health at risk. Alcohol is another, but it's not only that. It's everything that comes with prevention. A lot of what is in our environment, and we talked about before, need to be addressed for prevention. So, yes, the cancer, beating cancer plan is ambitious, but I believe that if we work together and we work responsibly, we can bring about change. I have absolutely no qualms on taking up those who um, are not in favor of moving in the right direction because we can't afford not to. Cancer is part of our everyday lives and everyday lives of many, many citizens. And I said it when I was speaking at the beginning, we need to look at it holistically. And it, prevention is a very important part of this and we need to look at it horizontally and put lifestyles into it because people's lifestyles are part of prevention. So I would invest a great deal in information, in working with stakeholders for prevention, for changing lifestyles, for looking at safer food. Thank you. Uh, by definition, prevention will take time. Uh, so returning to the issue of cancer treatments for today, can I invite you to say a little bit more uh, about your efforts to ensure equal access to cancer treatments today. I think in a previous answer, we got close to a very firm commitment on pushing forward and you put in your full energy behind the health technology assessment. So perhaps can we have absolute clarity uh, on that? And specifically also, uh, would you envisage bringing forward a revision of the paediatric and orphan medicines uh, regulations? Uh, the Pediatric and Orphans Medi um, Medicines Regulation is currently um, being evaluated. This is a regulation that was formed to ensure better access to um, uh, children and uh, those with rare diseases and also to increase therapeutic choices. So I would want to see the results of that evaluation. Um, we need to encourage more cross-border trials in, the, in cases of uh, pediatrics. And to work, uh, we already mentioned it, with uh, not only health technology assessment, but also e-health and the European reference networks, which have made um, a, a huge uh, change. There was um, a European Parliament resolution, I think in 2016, which stressed inequalities. Um, and for me, it's quite clear that we need to update our strategies. But I would like to wait and uh, see, and that is not just pushing it forward, 
I believe I need to base my uh, my way forward on, on evidence and on science to see the evaluation of the, of the regulation that has been put in place, which has made a difference. Thank you. For Renew, Martin Osik. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Madam Commission Designate. Um, and I'm very happy that the issue of cancer prevention and environmental health has been so high on the agenda because Honestly, uh, we face a really big problem. And the problem is not only uh, the issue itself, but also how we deal with it and the lack of transparency. Uh, the speakers before me raised very loudly the problems with bees, the problems uh, with the permissions for the pesticides. And there's been one threat that went through this, including the endocrine disruptors, and that's the lack of transparency due to the comitology procedures. Now, the European Ombudsman found out uh, in uh, her finding on the Transport uh, uh, Technical Committee uh, that there was a breach on, uh, in uh, not giving the access to uh, the results of the vote. Now, I wonder how does the Commission and how do you uh, like to follow on the recommendations on the European Ombudsman in this committee and whether you see, will see a greater transparency uh, in terms of the comitology procedure. Thank you. Transparency needs to be at the heart of what we are, what we are doing. And I, I, if we're all honest in this room with ourselves, one reason that we have um, lost citizens' trust in a lot of what we do in terms of uh, food safety, in terms of innovation, in terms of um, uh, protection has to do with uh, the, uh, the fact that they feel that there isn't the transparency of many, many of the results that, um, that they should have access to. In this sense, uh, I mentioned before, the changes in the general food law uh, based on transparency will, I hope, help us build a better relationship and citizens' trust. I think that this is imperative. Um, I would also here like to say that a lot of what we were discussing before to do with um, uh, bees and the, and the bee guidance document is not so much due to lack of transparency but due to the resistance of member states to implement it. And, and this has come out. So um, I think that there's a number of aspects that we need to look at. And transparency for myself is very important because without it, we cannot gain citizens' trust. And a lot of what you do in this parliament and a lot of what we hopefully will try and do in the commission will not go across if we don't build up this trust in the policies that we're proposing. And people have lost their confidence for a number of reasons. And I aim to try and work very closely with all stakeholders uh, in order to, to build this confidence up again so that we can work forward together. I believe very much in working closely with you. Um, you, are, you can uh, give us back a lot of the feedback so that we are able to realign what we're doing and thinking. Thank you. I'm very happy to hear your commitment to transparency. So I would like to follow up to, to check if you will call on the member states, because I believe that the fact that these decisions are made often in the, the, in the standing committees behind the closed doors, will you call on the member states and will you demand that these decisions are made automatically public and which member state, how they voted? Thank you. I will work closely with member states in order to convince them that we need to be transparent and I will try to find the ways forward for this. I believe that this is um, something that is very, very important. I'm aware that there have been problems, but um, I'm not uh, naively optimistic that uh, with an honest uh, discussion, we can find the ways forward. We're not there to punish. We're there to try and find consensus. And that's how I've worked all my life at different levels. And this is a challenge that I will gladly take up now. 
Thank you. Thank you. For the EPP, Eva Kobatz. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I would like to thank Madam Kiriakidis for a very comprehensive presentation of your vision for your activities as a commissioner. I would like to ask a question concerning the European program uh, for combating cancer. And I must say that I'm very satisfied that you have already answered my question before I ever answer, asked it. Thank you very much for that. So I would like to ask a brief question concerning uh, drugs policy. In many European member states, we see shortages of the necessary drugs, not only, the, uh, not only cancer drugs. Uh, in particular, here we focus on the inexpensive medicinal products. And I would like to ask the following question. How are you going to solve this problem? Thank you. I'm sorry if I took up so much of the time speaking about the cancer plan. Um, uh, it is a very important part of my mission letter and um, uh, something that uh, really, for me, it's, it's um, an unbelievable opportunity to be able to work this for this at the European level if I'm given the chance. You are right. Medicine shortages are a huge issue. And the member states and the, I think the European Medicinal Authority have set up a task force um, and we are now waiting to see uh, the information that comes out of this. Shortages are not um, due to only one reason. Uh, there's a lot of reasons um, because of pricing, because of reimbursements, because of um, industry. What we could look at is if there was a way for us to have an early detection of shortages, to see where we could pick them up. One reason that they've attributed shortages to, and I often hear it said, is parallel trade. And this is a concern, but of course um, we cannot ban it within the EU, but member states do have the, the opportunity to place restrictions on exports if they do have problems of shortages. So I tie this in together with access to medicines. For me, shortages and affordability are equally important because two reasons. First of all, the pharmaceutical industry has an obligation, a legal obligation, to allow access um, to, uh, for, of medicines to patients. But secondly, it is a patient's right to have access to affordable medication that will be safe um, in terms of their health care. So I, would, um, I don't have a quick answer, I don't have a quick fix, but I am aware of the many different levels that we need to work for in order to move forward. And a uh, very short question. Is anything being done right now about modifying the fees that are paid by pharmaceutical companies uh, to the budget of the European Medic Medicines Agency? If they are not in progress, are you going to undertake such work, such activities? Thank you. From what, um, from what I know, uh, I, I think they are in progress. Uh, but it's something that needs to be looked at because it is extremely important and I believe that it could help us move forward and it could also uh, encourage innovation in terms of new medicines that we need to be available to the European citizen. Thank you. Thank you. For SND, Maria Arena. President, merci, Madame. Chairman, Commissioner Designate, I'm going to go back to the issue of pesticides. You said that you work, you base your work on scientific evidence. Well, we now have an increasing number of scientific studies that show the link between these pesticides and negative effects on health. These pesticides are inhaled and taken into the human body from contaminated soils, etc. 
We've seen that during recent years the sale of pesticides has remained constant in the European Union, which means that in spite of all these studies, users still believe that they should be using them. I wasn't very satisfied with the, your responses on this issue, so I'm going to reword the questions. Firstly, how can you guarantee that the pesticides directive has been and is being correctly transposed by member states who had problems when it came to transposition and what are you going to do to ensure that member states do their jobs? And the second question is, what are you going to do in tangible terms to reduce member state dependence on these pesticides? An action plan, perhaps? You mentioned you've talked a great deal about a cancer action plan. Could you have an action plan to fight against the use of pesticides? And also, what are you going to do to oblige member states to use alternatives which exist, non chemical alternatives. I'm not going to ask the same question as Mr. Confin with regard to the objectives on which there are figures because you didn't uh, provide a response to his question so uh, given that you won't, uh, didn't answer his question I can't imagine you're going to give me more information than you gave him. Thank you. I am, um, I'm going to repeat what I said because I think it's important that I'm, I'm heard. And I had said that I can commit to lowering dependency on pesticides and working towards that, and to work towards finding new low-risk alternatives. In no way do I underestimate the effect that pesticides has on health. And it would be unheard of to be a health commissioner and not to take this on. Member states, uh, we know that there is strong legislation in Europe. We know that. It's not being implemented effectively. There are audits constantly going on and we need to monitor member states and see why it isn't being implemented. And um, where we see that this is ongoing, we need to take measures. But what I would like to be absolutely clear on that this is not something that is in isolation to everything else. It's part of the Green Deal that we're all going to work towards and it's part of Farm to Fork. And building this into it, we cannot have an effective Farm to Fork strategy or an effective Green Deal if we are not facing and able to uh, face and deal with issues such as pesticides. Well, let me now talk about highly toxic chemicals. We currently have legislation which was brought about under comitology which allows these high-risk uh, chemical products to continue to be used in spite of studies that show how toxic they are. We often renew the derogation on their use year after year. Sometimes those derogations have run for over five years, which means that these chemicals remain on the European market. This is utterly unacceptable and doesn't encourage industry to move towards replacement substances. What are you going to do to encourage industry to move towards substances that can replace those chemicals? Is it possible to prevent this comatology process by an assessment that shows how toxic these products are? Thank you. Thank you. I'm, um, I'm, not, I'm not absolutely sure if you're referring to glyphosate. Uh, no, not only. Because that was given a five-year approval, and I know that this was very divisive, and it's about to be start to be evaluated. Um, I believe that we need transparency. I believe that we need to base our uh, decisions on science. I would work very closely for risk reduction targets. I think that they're very important. Um, and um, this I would do as part of the Green Deal. It's, um, it's, it's for myself a part of what I consider to be one health, and this uh, is built into it directly. So, um, uh, yes, uh, we need to also encourage innovation in terms of, of uh, using um, less toxic and low-risk alternatives. We need to do this. 
We need to provide these so that um, people don't, farmers do not use um, chemicals that are harmful to, to human health, and we know that they are. Thank you. For the Greens, TMS. Uh, Commissioner in Spain, I would like to ask you about GMOs. The European Parliament has a very strong position on this issue. We adopted 36 objections to GMO authorizations last term. And as you know, there was never a qualified majority of member states in favor of GMO authorizations. So the, the Commission has to decide. And so far, the Commission's standard response to these GMOs has been yes. Why? The Commission has no legal obligation to say yes. And there are many legitimate reasons to say no. So do you commit to respecting democracy and to listen, as you said, carefully to the Parliament and Member State on this issue? Are you going to stop saying yes to GMOs when there is no qualified majority in favour? My second point is on new GMOs. The European Court of Justice ruled that organisms derived from gene editing fall under a used GMO legislation. This was in July, July 2018. However, the EU Commission is yet to take any meaningful action to protect consumers and farmers from these new GMOs. So do you commit to fully implementing the court ruling as a matter of urgency including in relation to safety assessment, traceability, and labeling. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I am very aware that uh, GMOs is a very sensitive and has often been a divisive issue. I'm also aware that what we are faced with, despite what science sometimes shows us, is a lack of citizens' trust concerning GMOs. I am uh, hopeful, and I've mentioned this before, that the general food law and the changes in transparency will allow us to have a better picture of what we're dealing with. Um, decisions will be based on science. The European um, EFSA authorizes um, only safe GMOs, but, but 19 member states have taken the decision to restrict the cultivation of GMO territory. So it's not only science, it's also what, citizens, uh, what citizen concerns they are. I am very, very aware of the Court of Justice decision of 2018. I fully respect it, and I believe we should work towards its implementation. I would formulate a position after having all the information and working with you and other stakeholders I also, uh, you, you noted, um, I noted you said, will you respect and say yes to democracy and will you listen to this parliament? I may not be able to commit to many things, but I will commit to two things. That yes, I always respect democracy. And the second one, and it wasn't empty words, is that I will listen to Parliament and I intend to be available and work closely with you because a lot of these uh, issues, like GMOs, like new breeding techniques, Parliament has had a crucial role in highlighting them, bringing forward resolutions that has led to change. So uh, I look forward to be able to working with Parliament and Member States and other stakeholders to take this forward. And again, at the risk of sounding monotonous, this is part of what I see, my farm-to-fork strategy. Continue immediately. Um, just you say that there are only GMOs that are safe. We know that there are gaps in the EFSA assessment. They don't address herbicide residues such as glyphosate and glyphosinate, uh, which are toxic for reproduction. But you answered the question on the democratic legitimacy. I mean, I'm glad about that. But uh, for the traceability of new GMOs to be possible, we also need urgently detection methods to be developed, and we need you to lead the way. Are you committed to doing so? Thank you. 
First of all, um, I'm very aware that EFSA is under my political responsibility and I will never hesitate if I see that uh, there is something that I need to be looking into it, to look into it. The second uh, thing is that uh, I, I personally um, would want to look at uh, new breeding techniques uh, in terms of the information that comes out in terms of the science um, that is provided. And if we need a new framework, I would definitely not hesitate in looking into that. Um, I'm very aware of the lack of citizens' trust, but more aware of citizens' concern. So we cannot move forward without making sure we're transparent in order to be sure that people trust what we're offering. And people need to know what the food at their table comes, what environment their children are growing up in. Thank you. For ID, Oscar Lincini. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, now, concern on food fraud and the quality of food undermines the confidence and health of consumers and damages the entire European food sector, so farmers and traders. In recent times, there have been various scandals, fibrinin and eggs in 20, uh, 2017. Then there was ho non-declared horse meat and beef products. Issues which uh, are relating to names that sound Italian cause massive economic damage to Italy. I think the problem is that we can't detect these issues. Weaker member states can't carry out the appropriate controls and criminal sanctions aren't appropriate to deal with these urgent issues. There need to be appropriate sanctions for transgressions. There are overlaps in competences uh, when it comes to the Commission, DG Agri, DG Sante, and in the 2017 regulation on official controls, Article 108, there is a provision which states that the Commission has the possibility to determine the rules for the exchange of information. How does the Commission intend to improve the prevention and enforcement system at the European level? Thank you. Thank you for that question. I share your concerns. Um, Food fraud, uh, I, I believe, has a, a cost of about 8 to 12 billion to industry. So um, it has affected uh, consumer trust, and we need to do something about it. There, unfortunately, from my understanding, there is no real legal definition of food fraud. It causes deception. It is a global problem. I'm aware that the European Parliament heard the resolution, I think, as far back as in 2013. We need to use all the agencies available, like Europol and the Anti-Fraud Office, in able to de uh, detect um, food fraud. And yes, I would be um, very willing, working with, uh, with all, to see if we need new legislation to control this, how we would food move forward. Could we have a microphone for the speaker, please? Could the speaker speak a bit more slowly, please? Il motivo per cui la sicurezza the reason why the safety of materials that are going to come into contact with food needs to be assessed is because these materials can send chemicals into foods which compromises the health of consumers. Legislation on this, Regulation 1935 for, uh, 2004, excuse me, is a solid legal basis, but it's only for a few substances, for example, plastics. Many substances are only regulated at the national level, and this means that there is a lack of homogene homogeneity when it comes to safety for European consumers and also in terms of business competitiveness. Is the Commission going to work in the coming years to adopt specific harmonised measures also for other materials? 
Thank you. Uh, I think you're referring to food contact materials, an extremely important uh, subject because of substances entering into the food and changing, uh, potentially uh, affecting human health, but also changing the consistency of the food. The, um, there's a regulation on all food contact materials of 2004, which is now being evaluated. And I'm aware that this parliament um, in 2016 asked for uh, another uh, 13 possible food contact materials to be, um, to be regulated. Uh, it is true that uh, the rules um, followed by member states differ. We do now have uh, information, the report coming out um, uh, uh, on uh, plastics, but we do not have information on a lot of other materials. Um, I would add something to this. EFSA is looking into it, but I would add something into this, if, you, if I may be allowed. Um, we also need to have information on the cocktail effects of uh, different food contact materials, because this is also very important and can impact on human health. Um, in terms of what you asked, if we're going to regulate um, the um, other food contact materials. I understand the concern. I would look at the science and I would move ahead with priorita prioritization, starting off with those that we know are potentially more harmful to human health. But it's um, a very important area that we will be taking up not only in uh, Green Deal but also in Farm to Fork because it affects the food that we're eating. Thank you. For ECR, Herman Tercet. Sí, buenas. Good afternoon, uh, Ms. Kiriakides. We uh, live in difficult times. Science and technology are often marginalized in debate which focuses on emo emotion. They're eclipsed by disinformation uh, or pushed uh, to, um, to, to the side when decision making comes to be taken. Your predecessor defended uh, science, um, but uh, President Juncker and the others could not uh, or did not support him uh, in the crusade against uh, science. The problem continues to grow. How will you uh, ensure the support? Uh, uh, of the, your colleague of commissioners to support uh, uh, science and, and specifically uh, com Commissioner Designate, uh, I'd like to know what specific ideas you have to increase the role of science, real science uh, against uh, ideology in the legislative process Thank you I'm a firm believer that we need to base policy decisions on science. This is not always possible. It's not always even accepted by citizens because of the level of misinformation. And I'll give you one example. We have the science which shows us that um, it is important that we use and, uh, uh, vaccines. And yet we have in the last few years seen a number of diseases uh, br breaking out in Europe. We have measles because of vaccine hesitancy. And I will not say that that is only due to misinformation mm -hmm. because it is also related to the programs that member states have for, uh, for vaccination and there seems to be uh, no uniformity. But um, there is an EU joint action on, on that. And together with the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control and the European Medical Agency and member states, we need to fight any source of misinformation which in fact impacts uh, negatively on where we, know, where we know that there is um, solid science. So uh, I may be... What I would aim for... It's having a very responsible voice in the college using science as a basis, but also taking into consideration and sharing their other concerns to be able to convince that we need to move forward with many of the policies that we know are needed to protect human health. And unfortunately, um, misinformation is something that we are seeing over the last 
few years, maybe many, some of us didn't predict it would get this far, uh, create huge problems in terms of uh, what we believe in should be done uh, for science. So this uh, disinformation also has further effects. Any economic activity, um, for, um, including uh, research, also needs uh, long-term support. Uh, um, research and, and development in the area of agriculture, for example, is um, leaving the European Union. This is because of legislation which... Uh, is anti-science uh, often and the disproportionate uh, uh, use of the precautionary principle. And this is often for very uh, pol uh, political and ideological reasons. We're creating... Uh, we are mistaken here, for example, in demonising phytosanitary products when we block um, certain um, products when there's no uh, other products. We're also looking at uh, uh, gene editing... Commissioner Designate, will you commit to revising the definition of a precautionary principle and also will you support the principle of the innovation that the European Union needs so that we can be a global leader here in Europe? We cannot afford not to be a global leader here in Europe. Uh, Europe needs to be leading the way in many areas related to health. And in terms of science and innovation, I think that this is a very important area. I'm aware that in the past, um, because of the Clinical Trials Directive, I don't remember now the year, there was a lot of dif difficulty in the promotion of cl clinical trials in Europe, and the result of that was that we had more clin clinical trials happening outside Europe in the USA, and, the, um, uh, and we fell behind. And the directive has worked towards changing that so we are able to provide more science, more clinical trials to patients. Um, we are committed to innovation. We are committed to uh, moving ahead and investing in research. The Horizon 2020 program has uh, already committed to that. So uh, I would um, definitely consider this to be a priority because moving ahead with innovation and science can only make, um, be more effective for European health because this will affect industry, it will find affect medicines, it will affect the Green Deal, it will affect the food we're eating. So... Uh, for myself, Europe needs to become a leader and be a leader in this, and in the pharmaceutical industry, because this way we're going to be able to face problems like drug, sh drug shortages and affordability, and, and this is something that we are committed to. Thank you. Uh, please keep to your time, uh, if possible. Uh, for EPP, Mr. Alukowicz. Panie Przewodniczący, Pani Przewodnicząca, tutaj na wprost. Chair, uh, I'm here. I'm here right uh, in the center, in the first row. So uh, during this term of office, for the Parliament and for yourself as a commissioner, all of us are facing one major challenge. Will we find the courage, the true courage, to face the true murderer of uh, Europeans, uh, that is, cancer. I am a doctor and I worked for, num for many years in the oncological department, pediatric, in pediatrics. Uh, and as a former Minister of Health, I know full well that if we leave member states on their own and to their own resources, uh, fighting, uh, fighting cancer, this, this battle will never be won. We do have standards for oncological treatment patient, uh, for, for children, but we do not have such standards for adults. And unless we face this battle, unless we take this challenge, uh, people will never ever forgive us. We need to build standards for early diagnostics and uh, modern ways of treating all patients across Europe. 
This is the task and the challenge that we're facing together, yourself and ourselves. And this is the task for our life. Thank you. Dr. Alkowitz, I wouldn't even try and step into the position of trying to to say that what you have said is not absolutely right, but I will add something. There are protocols in terms of treatment for cancer patients, but these are not always followed. And we need to make sure that they're followed. And when we're talking about a a beating cancer plan, we need to look at the whole range. And I'll give you an example. Screening, we know, protects lives. Early diagnosis saves lives. But it is not enough to just have a screening program in a country. Member states need to have screening programs that are accredited and that meet certain guidelines. And this European Parliament was the one that issued a resolution defining what screening programs should meet in terms of criteria. And we are responsible through audits to make sure that these are being enforced. I totally, I could not agree more with you. Cancer is, um, for many, a disease that affects not only the patient but the family, the employer. We have issues now that nobody touches on, cancer survivorship. What happens to the thousands of patients after cancer and how are they dealt with in their working place? How are, how, what type of health insurance are they allowed if they say they have been through cancer? It's a huge area. But this is why I'm challenged by having the European Beating Cancer Plan specifically mentioned in my mission letter. We didn't have this before. A lot of good work has been done in this parliament. There was the um, a Committee of Members Against Cancer, uh, which did wonderful work and pushed things forward. Now we can take it on again. In Poland, I was the one to introduce this so-called oncological package, cancer package, which meant that we decided to fund from public uh, resources uh, all the activities of those doctors and clinics which will follow the standard and provide early diagnosis, and we were not limiting the the spending. But there's yet another challenge. In 2012, uh, a number of European member states faced a severe shortage of certain oncological uh, medicines, and patients' lives were at risk. Uh, Are you ready to build a program or a system that would ensure that such a situation never occurs again? Because in oncological treatment, the time is crucial. Thank you. I had the honor and the pleasure of visiting your country, in fact, and working very closely with um, doctors there and others to look at the screening programs that were being put into place, and they were extremely uh, important because they opened the way for many other countries. Um, The European uh, Beating Cancer Plan needs to look at uh, the whole range. We heard here from a colleague on prevention. We are talking about uh, accreditation and standards, and this would also include medicines. And um, I'm aware that uh, many member states who have been through difficult uh, economic situations, this did lead to an impact on care. pharmaceutical industry has an obligation to make sure that patients have access to affordable uh, medicines and we would put this, I would put this under the, under the plan and work towards it. Uh, there can be no, um, we cannot lower the bar in any way when we're dealing with this disease. Thank you. For Renew, Caroline Vodden. Madam Kiriakides. Article, I'm here. Article 168 of the EU Treaty on Public Health states that action will be directed to prevent both physical and mental health. Um, You've practiced as a clinical psychologist for 27 years, so it will come as no surprise to you that more than one in six people across the EU had a mental health problem in 2016, and that all available evidence suggests that mental health problems 
now affect tens of millions of Europeans every year. They affect families, relationships, job prospects and productivity. Madam Commissioner-designate, we are witnessing an epidemic of childhood and adolescent mental health disorders with record levels of self-harm, depression, eating disorders and suicide. What are you going to do to put mental health back on the EU agenda and what concrete steps will you put in place to ensure that Member States fully implement mental health policies and EU recommendations on mental health? Thank you. Uh, when we were speaking before, uh, it was um, uh, on some uh, questions that had to do with other issues, but I spoke about One Health, and I spoke about One Health being human health, animal health, and plant health. When, when I speak about human health, I don't only speak about the, the body, but I also speak about the mind, because it's, it's intricately together. And you're absolutely right. Mental health... Um, uh, it has not been on the agenda for a very long time. There are a number of reasons for this. In many member states, um, there is still a lot of stigma about it, and people are not coming forward early enough so that they do receive the help that they need. We're living at a time when the pressures on children and adolescents are constantly changing. They're also being bombarded with information that... Um, their development possibly does not allow them to filter and be able to take in. And um, uh, we need to address this, and I would do my utmost to put it back on the agenda because I believe that mental health is an area that for many member states does not receive the attention that uh, it deserves. And it is important that we do something to reverse this trend. I'm not only speaking about um, um, depression in, in adults, but if we look at the, the problems that we're seeing with adolescents in terms of behavioral problems, in terms of um, increases in self-destructive behavior, Behavior. We need to work preventively. We need to work not only in health but also in education and go into schools at a very young age, pick up problems at a very young age so as to be able to help. And uh, this is something that is um, a very important part at least of, of my um, future policies. Thank you. Um, it's interesting to hear you say that it's so important to you, but we've been sitting here for two hours and the words mental health haven't been mentioned by anyone in this room. So, you know, I find that quite astonishing. Um, we know that there are many factors behind mental illness. Some of them are environmental rather than medical. So how are you going to work with other commissioners across the college to ensure that issues such as educational stress, social media influencing, sexual assault, bad working conditions, poor housing, low pay and social isolation, these all need to be improved in order to reduce the incidence of mental health disorders across the EU. And you say you will do your utmost, but I'd like to hear what you are actually going to do. Are, will, are we going to invest money? Will we have new programs? Will we have training for countries where mental health isn't so high on the agenda? What are you actually going to do to change this? Working across uh, with commissioners, I think, is very important because mental health comes into many different areas, as you have mentioned. And um, also we need to address the different problems in different member states, and the commission has uh, uh, potentially the opportunity to look at what these issues are and see what to change. It's, um, it's interesting because uh, you mentioned somebody else in this room mentioned health, but I mentioned it in my opening statement, because I do consider it important. And, um, I mentioned it because I believe that um, one of the reasons possibly that not so much is done is because this is often a forgotten population. And you are right, many different factors that impact, so I would work with other commissioners to bring in the health thread across many of the policies. And I believe that um, I would be able to be a voice for this, and I intend to be a voice for this. Thank you. The non inscrit The previous speaker mentioned it. 
I'd like to ask a question, a, a complex question, about what you will do as Commissioner for Health. Will you help research in um, medicine and health on the following issues? For example, the national culture about what is uh, natural or is it considered normal and abnormal for each country. The categories of biomedicine, how are they perceived in various national cultures? How do you identify diseases that are known as national disorders, syndromes that have to do with culture, like uh, anorexia or the BMS? Furthermore, how different factors have to do with various uh, illnesses of mental or physical health. All these matters are not unfounded uh, concerns. They are documented by the so-called uh, fifth edition of the DSM, which talks about cultural uh, uh, patents on identifying diseases. And Kiermaier and Rousseau have, have so there should be more done for her mental health. Thank you for your question. Stand it all, but I will try and address it as as um, carefully as possible. I am aware that the DSM has at times changed its classifications of what is a psychiatric or other disorder. We have seen this. Many disorders that were before not con uh, considered psychiatric disorders have now been taken out of the DSM classification. So we need to be aware of this and we need to follow suit in terms of what uh, society and what uh, the way forward is for, for, for different um, issues. You mentioned um, um, anorexia and there are societies which don't recognize this and there are other societies which have a huge problem with this. Um, I, would, um, I would put as my primary... Um, foundation that utmost, uppermost for me is the protection and promotion of human rights. I believe that this needs to be uh, in an area like psychiatry something which is extremely sensitive because it's extremely easy to put a label in terms of a, a psychiatric diagnosis and this can sometimes be very subjective depending on the culture where someone is. So I would look at it um, very carefully. The issue of normality, I think you mentioned normality, that's uh, quite subjective. We often have different definitions of what is normal. And it would definitely take me a lot more than two minutes to go into that discussion. But I would look forward to talking about this with you at another time. Thank you, Ms. Kiriakidis. You covered up the core of my question. Thanks. It's a nice follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for SND, Sarah Serdas. Uh, Madam Commissioner, designate. Uh, my question concerns one of the main challenges we face, AMR is responsible for 33,000 deaths every year in the EU and costs 1.1 billion euros to healthcare systems in the EU. One of the main issues is the misuse of antibiotics without medical recommendations or not following medical recommendations. Another issue is the return of preventable diseases, as you have said before, due to a drop in vaccination rates leading to unnecessary use of antimicrobials for treatment. 
We need more health literacy to promote health and to fight against this anti-vaccination misinformation and to ensure citizens know how to use information properly. What is your strategy to increase health literacy and health education? You touched on, um, on two topics which are... Um, Direct, directly related because they're both um, very relevant to what is health literacy and misinformation. And unfortunately, um, one of the drawbacks of what we see in today's uh, digital age is how easy it is to spread misinformation through so many media. So what we need to do is ensure that we work very closely with member states, addressing these problems, making sure citizens have access to reliable scientific information, and where we see that there is misinformation, immediately dealing with it. Um, you mentioned antimicrobial resistance, which is a devastating problem, and it's a global problem. And I would very much like um, to see the EU lead here by example, because it is under the One Health Agenda and we need to be responsible because we cannot, as you said, excuse 33,000 deaths in the EU because of this problem. In the same way, we cannot have children losing their lives to diseases that a few years ago were eradicated in Europe. So, we need to work together through education and through health in order to um, fight and challenge the misinformation that is now out there and that is directly impacting on human health. follow-up question on that. We have that tuberculosis is uh, one disease where AMR is of special concern, and we have that 40 to 50 percent of patients with multi-drug resistance, TB, will die. Two weeks ago, DG Santé closed down an expert group of the European Commission, the EU HIV, AIDS, viral hepatitis, and tuberculosis think tank, as well as the EU HIV AIDS viral hepatitis and tuberculosis civil society forum. What is your opinion on this decision and how do you plan to tackle these public health problems without the crucial expertise of both these groups? I believe that there was an excellent European Parliament resolution on HIV um, hepatitis and TB in 2017. I think that, that and I wanted to, to thank Parliament for that because these are three diseases which are extremely important and they're three diseases that we can do a lot more and in terms of prevention. Um, the European uh, Centre for uh, Disease Prevention and Control um, is helping member states in order to be able to, to tackle this. We need to ensure access to innovation and to medicines for people with uh, TB and HIV, AIDS and hepatitis. And I would remind ourselves that the G7 in Biarritz committed 550 million pledged for these three diseases. And I intend to take up that pledge because they are um, impacting on a very large number of European citizens. So that would be my first priority to take up in the new commission. Thank you. For the EPP, Daniel Bouda, for the Agri Committee. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. Madam Commissioner-designate, I come from the Agri Committee and I'd like to talk to you a little bit now about animal health that for me is extremely important and uh, this has a major impact on human health and with you I think we should be taking an interest in this issue. African swine fever is uh, very much prevalent today in Eastern Europe and it seems that measures taken 
to date haven't been efficient in combating this virus, which knows no borders. Recently, we've been having to deal with an alarming increase in the number of cases. Just this year, we've detected 1,470 new outbreaks at European level. And there is a risk, then, that shortly... This virus will also be widely prevalent in states in Western Europe as well. So there's a serious concern today amongst farmers, but also amongst animal health experts, uh, with regard to the devastating impact that this will have on the sector. And unfortunately, we're talking about thousands of farmers affected. So what is your vision and strategy, madam, uh, for the short and medium term in order to prevent the spread of this scourge? How can we diversify measures to combat this and biosecurity? measures as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. First of all, I want to be absolutely clear that I consider animal welfare uh, and animal health as, as part of my one health that I had mentioned before. This is part and parcel. So it is not something that I don't consider important. Um, African swine fever is a devastating disease. And um, it does not affect humans but it is a threat to valuable farming and, of course, to trade. There is a global situation that is still of concern. I will say, though, and um, this is a little bit different to the position that was stated, um, that the Commission has, had, has a robust legal framework and a harmonized strategy on this, and it has helped contain African swine fever in some areas. The example of the Czech Republic, it has been eradicated. In other areas, because of the close borders with other uh, countries which are uh, affected, um, there is a bigger problem. So I believe that what we need to do here is to have effective controls, to um, increase biosecurity on farms, to raise public awareness and invest in research because for the moment we do not have a vaccine for it. And in this way, um, have the European Union lead by example to make sure that we do not have further spreading of a disease that um, may be affecting pigs and wild boar, but it is a devastating disease for those living in the areas and the farmers. So I'm very aware of it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for that answer. Madam Commissioner-designate, in the European Union we have the civil protection mechanism uh, which seeks to intervene in a coordinated way when there are floods and fires and that it means that the member states receive support in terms of logistics and equipment to help them deal with the challenges they face. Do you think that it would be possible to create a similar mechanism in the case of animal health uh, where there are outbreaks at a large scale such as for contagious animal diseases? That would mean then that the Commission could act in a quick and coordinated manner. You could uh, support national authorities with the insinuation on a large scale in affected areas. Um, and I have to say this because it's extremely difficult to efficiently deal with the spread of the virus when it appears in a region or in a complex, for example, uh, where there are people living as well. Thank you. Thank you. The, 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 there, is, there is actual intervention in terms of crisis uh, where we have epidemics or animal diseases, which is quite effective. And this has been clear because in the case of the African swine fever, we ha the European Union has managed to contain it to a certain degree. We need to be proactive and we need to be able to immediately react when we have such situations so that we are able to control it uh, as quickly as possible. I'll raise with you an issue that hasn't come up, but um, uh, possibly may, uh, and that is another problem that we've had, which is not with animal health, but plant health, and that was the problem that we have in Italy with xylella where we have determined, which is also another devastating problem because it affects the olive trees and others of that area, not only Italy. Uh, and the European Union did come forward with specific measures in order to be able to contain it. Member states um, need to be helped to enforce these measures so that we are able to be as far as possible proactive, uh, but also 
to have a crisis system which is in place um, in order to intervene as quickly as possible. Um, I wish I could provide you with an answer of saying that we will eradicate African swine uh, fever over the next few months. A lot has been done. The countries which are not within the European Union and have taken no measures have a much bigger problem and spreading. And this is possibly why, why countries bordering onto them and with the wild boar continue to have the problem. So we need to do more. We need to keep it on the agenda because it's affecting farmers, valuable farming, and it's affecting trade. Thank you. For the way, Joe Ferreira. Obrigado, President. Thank you, Chair. I'm just over here, uh, Commissioner Designate. Uh, today, we've already spoken about uh, pesticides and authorization uh, procedure. We've talked about GMOs, talked about food safety and medication. We're talking about uh, areas where, over the years, um, we've seen that there's been evidence uh, of uh, links uh, between uh, the European Commission's agencies and the industry, you know, obviously revolving doors, but also procedures uh, for authorizations uh, themselves and, and the manner which they're carried out. This um, leads to um, questions around uh, transparency and the rigour of the authorisation process. So the question uh, I wanted to ask, what's your uh, evaluation of the situation? How close do you think the links are? What do you, and what do you uh, envisage doing? Uh, will you still trust the uh, risk analysis that comes from industry? Or should we have public uh, authorities in this area, public institutions who could have a, a active intervention in authorizations or, and licensing process um, via being able to conduct uh, risk analysis. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I fully understand that there is um, a considerable amount sometimes of um, mistrust concerning some of the decisions that we see coming out of European agencies. Um, you mentioned EFSA. On the other hand, I would like us all to be reminded here that EFSA is monitored not only by the auditors, but it's also monitored by the Parliament. And I would also like us to be reminded that there are very strict rules of those on the scientific bodies of EFSA have to uh, declare um, uh, and update continuously uh, uh, their declaration of interests. I, put, uh, I place trust in, in the European bodies. I do believe that we do need independent assessments from industry for many things. Um, but I will also uh, say this and end um, my intervention with this. I'm aware that, for example, the AF as an agency is under my political responsibility. And I would have no hesitation if I felt that there was any sort of intervention that affected the uh, integrity and the validity of the science coming out of EFSA to, uh, to take this responsibility up myself. Thank you. I, I note your uh, response. Uh, uh, you could have said more, but uh, I wanted to go back to uh, a topic which has already been uh, mentioned, uh, and I wasn't particularly pleased with your responses. These, uh, the topic I'd like to talk about uh, is on pesticides again and evaluation process. Uh, now how will you ensure that the risk analysis in these procedures don't only take into account the acute uh, effects but also the chronic effects? And a final question, uh, again, on pesticides and the evaluation process. How will you guarantee that... Uh, what isn't accepted into Europe via the front door is um, brought in through the back door via free trade agreements. Thank you. I'm, um, I'm trying to understand why I haven't been convincing on pesticides because it's the one area that I have said that I would commit to pesticide reduction and to low-risk alternatives. Obviously, um, 
I, this hasn't been convincing enough. Uh, I, I have said before, I, I, we are dealing with a problem here that is affecting public health. It's part of Green Deal and Farm to Fork, and we would, uh, I would look at it very carefully. Uh, also, I would add here that we need to look at low-risk alternatives. I would wait for evaluations of some of the um, that we're waiting to come out from, uh, from EFSA and take decisions based on that. Someone, uh, I'm not sure which um, parliamentarian spoke before about the importance of science, and we mustn't lose sight of this. So I think it is extremely important when we were talking about um, uh, endocrine disruptors, about neonics, about um, new breeding techniques, and about pesticides, that we do look at the science that is there. The general food law will, I hope, change the level of transparency that has been a big problem and creates a citizen mistrust. But I, can, I can't commit in a louder way that um, I would commit to the lowering of the dependence of, of pesticides and to finding low-risk alternatives. That is because it's part of what I consider to be One Health. It's part of Farm to Fork. It's part of Green Deal. And we cannot talk about One Health if we don't look at the whole area. And this includes human, environment, and animal and plant health. Thank you. For SND, Alexandra Moretti. Presidente, grazie. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Candidate. A balanced diet is crucial to prevent certain illnesses, including diabetes, certain tumors, cardiovascular diseases, and also in order to prevent forms of childhood obesity, which is becoming more widespread in Europe. Commissioner Desnick, do you agree that in order to get consumers to make healthy choices, it is key to provide them with transparent information based on scientific evidence and also to produce and promote food education programs. How does the Commission intend to prevent nutritional labelling scams? At the moment, uh, labelling is voluntary in many member states. Do you think that uh, a single labelling scheme at the European level could resolve that problem? And do you intend to present a proposal that will enable consumers to have information on the environmental impact of feed and also with regard to the use of feeds that contain uh, GMO products and then health claims, claims as well in order to prevent uh, cl there being claims of uh, non-existent benefits to human health. Thank you. We live at a, in a very paradoxical age, don't we? We talk about... Um obesity when we are not uh, we're now just recognizing the problem of uh, food waste uh, where we're wasting over 20 percent of our food and one uh, uh, in four europeans can't have a good quality meal every day so we clearly need to address these issues and um, i would uh, like to be able to deliver um, a five-year action plan to deal with food waste because I think it's a very important part of the sustainable food um, uh, effort that we're making. Um, you mentioned your nutrition labeling. It is, in fact, mandatory uh, on pre-packed food. Citizens want this. They want nutrition profiles. It's obvious that uh, when we're going to pick something off the shelf, we are more and more looking at to see if what we're reading is something that um, uh, we want to, uh, to buy. But I would remind you that um, the recent claims regulation has also found that a lot of what we're reading on the labels is, in fact, unfortunately not representative. And it's finding that there's high levels of salt or high levels of sugar that is being claimed. So we clearly need to do something about that. Um, the nutrient profiles are important. It's very important for citizens. There is a front of pack, front of pack, a uh, report coming out at the end of this year. I would wait to see the results and, um, and uh, move forward. 
uh, and I would like to see a common approach across member states. Whether this would be the Nutri score or not, um, I'm not in a position to say, but it would be one that would be considered. Thank you very much for your response. But in particular, you really put your finger on the problem, I think. How can we avoid distortions in the internal market? How can we ensure that consumers aren't deceived by labels that are too simplistic? I think that would end up discriminating against high-quality European products, apart from anything else. So how do you think a single labelling system, nutritional label system, uh, would work? First of all, um, we have excellent levels of controls within the European mar market to ensure that uh, citizens have access to safe food. And this is very important uh, so that we know what is also entering into the Union. Um, I have said already that I would wait to see the evaluation of the front of PAC to then, to then see and decide on a proposal. But I am concerned, as I have mentioned, about the claims regulation. There is something that uh, wasn't mentioned, and I would like to mention it, um, because a lot of consumers and citizens are now also demanding or wanting, uh, for a better word, uh, demanding is not the right, they, they have raised awareness about the need for origin labeling, and this has led to a number of member states, I think it's uh, seven member states, who have pro pro moved ahead on their own, and they now have a different origin labeling. Um, they are now, the seven member states, evaluating this, and um, uh, we need to, to look at it. We must not renationalize food in a single market, so we need to find common ways so that consumers have access to reliable information when they're purchasing or having access to food. And um, uh, this is something that uh, uh, is now being evaluated. I would look at all the information and then come forward with a proposal. Thank you. For the Greens, Margrethe Auken. Thank you and uh, honored, I'm here. Honored Commissioner uh, designated. <clears throat> One of the growing burdens on national health budgets and on access to medicine are abusively high prices on medicines, while EU member states are in a weak negotiation position due to the lack of transparency in the pricing. In 2017, the Parliament passed an INI report on access to medicines that called for transparency in medicine pricing concerning research and development expenditures and how much of that is public funded, how much is spent on marketing, lobbying, and so on, and what profit has been generated. Unfortunately, none of these transparency demands have been met by the Commission. At the World Health Organization this spring, Italy, Greece, Portugal, and other EU member states supported a medicine price transparency resolution that would require pharmaceutical companies to provide information of these aspects I just mentioned. In brief, a very good resolution. However, the resolution was watered down significantly, and even my own country, Denmark, took part in this disgraceful maneuver. Now my question, how will you ensure that the conditions for negotiations on medicine pricing in member states will be fair and transparent? Thank you very much. First of all, let's, uh, let's come back to the problem that we're really facing. And we're facing this problem uh, which is impacting on the patients' and citizens' lives because we have um, medicines they cannot afford and medicine shortages. So uh, I would um, work closely with all the stakeholders and with industry and the member states because we need to look at the pricing 
uh, me mechanisms of the member states and how medicines are also reimbursed because this is another huge problem. Um, there is a legal obligation by the pharmaceutical industry to provide access and supply of medicines. And um, we need to look at a new strategy that is going to be able to address both medicine shortages and uh, pricing. And um, uh, I would work very closely with uh, the member states to look at this because the problem that we also have with pricing and reimbursement is in fact um, uh, affecting the implementation of the cross-border control directive and how patients are accessing that. So uh, I would work very closely um, with uh, um, member states to see this. I also know that the member states have set up a task force with the European Medical Agency, if I am correct, and the report is uh, due to come out to be able to give us valuable information. And having that, uh, I will then uh, decide on how to, to move forward. But I would agree with you that a lot, we need to do a lot more. And in my mission letter, medicine affordability is clearly stated. So it's going to be high on my agenda. complicated than the question was. <laughs> Sorry. The question was very simple. And if you look into, and you can, because I only know the WHO uh, business by leakage, because it was secret. But you can get access to that. And this resolution in the WHO was really opposed by countries coming with big industry as Denmark, Germany, UK, and some other countries. And I think it would be so helpful to the member states who are now seeing rising uh, prices like this year, every year. On, and it's killing hospitals, it's killing you know, nurses, everything. Not nurses, killing them, but uh, uh, you know, reducing uh, the amount. And then you make a long, long, long speech. You make very good things on transparency, but coming to realities on simple questions, make sure that we have transparency on the prices, full stop. <laughs> I'm sorry that I complicated your question. <laughs> Maybe I don't have an easy answer, but I would, be so, I would uh, support transparency at all levels. I need to look into this more carefully. It is possible that I'm not um, um, now, I don't have all the information, and I would come back to you with it. So I want to be absolutely honest with that. Thank you. For Renew, Nicola Stefano. Madam Commissioner, designate, I will take you down the road that was opened already by Madam Kopach and uh, Madam Auken and speaks about scarcity some more. There is some risk about uh, speaking 24th on the list of, of repeating, but I will try to bring original uh, arguments into play, uh, particularly since this summer we are facing a huge crisis for, for cancer treatments in Italy, uh, neurological uh, medicines in Poland, uh, general uh, lack uh, of medicines in, in Belgium and in the country where I come from, Romania, 2017-2018, immunoglobulins uh, went missing, which made us uh, apply for the European Civil Protection Mechanism, which is a, sh uh, a, a proof of how creative you have to be to actually make health policy work for the citizen. And here is my, uh, my question, and one more one more word that was not mentioned today was Brexit that also comes into play when we talk about the availability of medicines on the market. So my questions are, can you let us know if you commit to the development of a European essential medicines list? Do you consider proposing legislation for early notification of shortages, and I think you did mention this point, but also acting upon emergencies? And in other words, because you've mentioned the market as a, as a solution in many of your answers previously, I guess we all want to know, will you be an intervention commissioner, will you be a creative commissioner, or will you be a status quo commissioner? Okay, option three, I guess, is a, <laughs> yeah. not the right one. So. Thank you. First of all, I have to become a commissioner. <laughs> 
then I'll let you judge working with me what kind of commissioner you think I am because I may think I'm going to be one of these three types and you may judge me differently. So uh, uh, I'll let you make the judge of that, of what kind of commissioner, if I become, I will be. Um, I mentioned the task force in the very complicated answer I gave here. Uh, in fact, the task force was set up by member states and the uh, European Medicinal Agency to um, bring forward valuable information concerning shortages. And yes, I did mention that we can do more and we need to find a system for early detection of shortages. And um, because I knew that there was absolutely no way that we would avoid, uh, avoid possibly a Brexit, and Brexit is something that has been of uh, great concern in terms of medicines to many member states. Um, I wanted to, and there is concern, um, the European Medicinal Agency and member states have raised company awareness so that a large number of the, the medications which are controlled centrally seem to be under control. But we are aware and I have seen that those which are um, authorized by national authorities, um, there is a problem uh, possibly with uh, access after, after Brexit. So um, uh, especially of two countries, the country I know best and, uh, and Malta. So what would um, I hope, uh, uh, what I would um, like to see happen is uh, a ratification of the withdrawal agreement so that we have minimal disruption in all areas, including access to medicines. Thank you. I would like to take you up on your point on the task force. Um, wouldn't be more suitable, rather than going through the European Medicines Agency, to try to think in terms of a pharmaceutical European institute or agency in charge of the prevention of shortages for essential medicines uh, through the coordination of, of uh, production platforms, perhaps? Uh, and secondly, on, on, on Brexit, my colleague kindly suggested to not mention Brexit in the clinical sense uh, today. I um, didn't uh, intend to, to mention it in the clinical sense. It is a concern that I shared. Um, it's possible that what you're proposing may be the way forward. But uh, I have said it uh, at the risk of sounding uh, monotonous that we need to have information before we make decisions. And the task force was set up in order to provide valuable information on shortages. So I would um, uh, want to assess the results of this task force, and then I would be open to all proposals and work with all stakeholders because we need to do more in terms of this huge problem which is impacting on European patients, which is called medicine shortages. Okay, so last but not least, Peter Lise. Thank you very much, Chair. And I'm in the same position like many colleagues. Uh, an important issue that I would like to raise was already um, answered, and I'm happy with your answers. Uh, anyhow, I think it's a, it's a difference like day and night with the hearing we had this afternoon. So I'm very happy, but I have more questions. So a specific question on antibiotic resistance. Um, we have mainly, I think, two challenges for you. First is implementation of the legislation on veterinary medicine. The Parliament pushed very much that reserve antibiotics that are the last resort for human beings should be, yeah, if not prohibited, then restricted very, very strongly. And I would say, are you ready to prohibit as much as possible, like the Parliament wanted? And the second um, Whatever we do, we need new antibiotics. And you said you want to encourage work with industry. But are you ready to look at uh, specific legislation like we have in pediatrics with a stick and a carrot so that industry is motivated to bring new uh, drugs to the market, but also we have some tools to, to motivate them even more with a, with a stick? <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Lisa. And although uh, it's the last question, I would say it's one of the most challenging ones. 
Um, I would, I would look at, I'd like to answer it in two parts. First of all, we have a new regulation in 2018 which has to do with, um, um, veterinary feed and, um, and uh, medicines, and this is almost the cornerstone of antimicrobial re- resistance. Uh, we now have uh, regulations in terms of where antimicrobials can be used, or sh- uh, they might put it a different way. They are banned and should not be used in the terms of um, uh, animal, uh, animal growth, and some need to be held back only for human use. Whether this regulation is being implemented effectively uh, needs to be seen. We have uh, a very effective system of audits um, visiting uh, member states, and we need to see where that is. I have mentioned um, industry and innovation. I believe that the European Union must lead by example in this, in uh, helping, so in um, working for, moving forward so that we have new um, antimicrobials available for patients. And um, in terms of what you mentioned before, uh, I would want to see the current evaluation of the legislation on orphans and pediatric medicines and seeing where its strengths and weaknesses were before proposing uh, uh, another legislation or a similar legislation. Sometimes it's not about having new legislation. Very often it's about implementation. So we need to look at both, both sides. And um, in this sense, the pediatric and orphan medicines uh, regulation has really um, uh, changed lives of very many uh, patients and children with rare diseases. It's being evaluated. We would look at it and then consider whether we need to propose new legislation. Short follow-up questions. Many member states agree that we need innovation, new antibiotics, but they don't understand that we need Europe, at least Europe, to act. Do you agree that it makes no sense when we have a market where it uh, is not attractive for industry to bring these drugs to the market, that national solutions are definitely not uh, possible? So we need European action, and do you commit to fight with member states that we need European action on this. I said earlier that I look to the future, but in this case I will go backwards because the Commission in 2017 proposed the second action plan for antimicrobial resistance. We are very aware, and there were 70 actions in that, um, under the One Health Agenda, which is now specifically in my mission letter, and although I sound extremely monotonous mentioning it, it's extremely important that we now have and I'm, I'm very challenged as a potential Commissioner of Health, a mission letter that puts these things down. It mentions antimicrobial resistance. It mentions endocrine disruptors. It mentions a cancer plan. It mentions a farm to fork. So this is now uh, there in front of us, and we need to be responsible and take up the challenge and do something. So in this way... Uh, I believe that we need to help uh, member states, but yes, we are already, uh, Europe needs to lead the way because the antimicrobial um, problem and resistance is a global problem and it does require global action. And I would like to see the European Union be a leader in this. Okay, so we are going to move to the, your conclusions. You have a, a maximum of five minutes if you don't want to... Uh... Use your five minutes if you're free. <laughs> I take that as we would rather you speak less than five minutes, but I won't. I'm, I'm so, first of all, um, I won't speak for five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Members of Parliament, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your time and for your questions. And uh, over the last few weeks, um, I have heard from so many that this hearing will be a daunting experience, and I can assure you that it has not been a walk in the park. Um, But it's been a challenge. And I actually very much enjoyed having the opportunity to have my first policy debate with you on what I am really hoping will be my future portfolio. 
Um, I think I have uh, spoken uh, uh, honestly, and you know that this portfolio is very close to my heart. I have no reason to be sitting here if it wasn't something that I believed in, and I believe we can bring about change together. And this is because this portfolio touches on the everyday life of citizens. And it touches on their health, it touches on their livelihood, it touches on their food. And when I talk about farm to health or one health, these are not slogans for me. Uh, these are the real, it's the essence of the reason I am here. I heard your concerns. I heard them carefully. Endocrine disruptors, microbial resistance, new breeding techniques, medicine affordability, and those were just a few. And I take these fully into account. And as I said in my opening intervention, we are at a critical point now where citizens expect us, us and all of us, to lead uh, and deliver transformational change. And we need to safeguard our achievements and our ecosystems for future generations. We are not at the point when we can do nothing because we owe this to citizens and we owe this to the union. I will be extremely honored to be part of this effort. I am determined to give everything in my power to deliver necessary solutions, always working closely with you. But I will also admit, I have a lot to learn. But I can assure you I'm going to hit the ground running if I'm appointed health commissioner. And I will always engage transparently and constructively with you because... After all, we are accountable to you. So in saying uh, these, I will um, end saying one small uh, statement. I firmly believe that we can no longer talk about public health and food safety and animal health and plant health as standalone subjects. I know at times these appear as if they're separate islands, but in fact... Um, they are profoundly connected and our citizens are demanding from us to bring about results. We all have one overreaching goal and that is One Health. We must work together for the benefit of our citizens. We must listen to civic society and to citizens. We must look for more science and I will share with you what I firmly believe that the EU can Strive for more. I want to thank you again for your time. I was under three and a half, just about three and a half minutes, Chair. Thank you for your time, Efkaristo, and uh, I hope we will have the chance to work closely together.